Good morning. <laughs> that, that was timed really well, yes. Oh, man. Well, how is everyone feeling today? Are we, I was going to say, are we telling lies in the house of the Lord? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. We, we've got some, we've got some, uh, some nice like energy crutches that are holding us up. All right. Well, we're going to get into some things today. If you have your Bible with you, be it electronic or page turner, go to Psalm 34 and just kind of keep that there. Because today we're going to be exploring quite a number of scriptures, and I have a funny feeling I'm going to hit this rock behind me, so I'm going to come forward a bit. There we go. Let me tell you a story. There was this man, and uh, he, he discovered something pretty interesting in his garden. It was an emperor moth cocoon. And he's like, wow, all right. And so he decides he's going to bring that indoors, and he's going to monitor it, just see what it does, watch the process, actually see this amazing creature emerge from the cocoon. And sure enough, uh, one day this very tiny openings, something kicks in in him. And he feels compassion towards this. And he says, something must be wrong. Because if there's this much struggling, something's happened in the process because surely it's not natural that it's going to take this long for a moth to break through something that essentially is so flimsy, so thin, so insignificant. Why is it this hard for him? There must be something that's gone gravely wrong. And now he has this instinct because, of course, he's invested all this time into wanting to see this emperor moth come forth. And so he takes a pair of scissors and he snips the opening wide. And the moth comes right out. Sure it does. But when it comes out, the moth has shriveled wings resting on its back and a bloated body. And he thinks, surely if I watch it for a bit, don't touch it, just let it be, the wings are naturally going to do what they do and they're going to spread and it'll take flight and that, that process will be over, but it didn't happen. He nursed that thing and it never changed states. It never took flight, its wings never spread, its body never stopped being bloated. What he didn't know is that the bloating in the body was actually wing fluid. And the struggle against the wall of the cocoon would encourage the fluid to go into the wings to plump them up, thin the body, and give it the strength it needed to fly. What he thought was an act of mercy was cruelty. And this forever affected the life of that one little insect. Today, I want to talk about suffering and struggle. Because the reality is, all Christians suffer. <laughs> this, is not, this is not something that is unfamiliar to us. Either you have, you are, or you will. But it's a guarantee. Let's go to Psalm 34, and let's read verse 18 and 19. Verse 18 and 19, Psalm 34, and here's what it says. The Lord is near to those who have, and I'm reading New King James, a what? A broken heart. You ever have a broken heart? You ever had your heart broken? And I'm not just talking romance. You ever have, you ever have a situation in which someone or something or a circumstance just like rended your heart in two and you're, you're sitting there saying, oh, I don't know if I could feel any more pain than I do right now. I've had those situations where I'm like, I think I'm at the max of what I can feel, and I don't, I, I don't want to know what happens after this. Like, I'm very much ready to tap out of the situation. It says, he's near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Verse 19, how many? Many are the afflictions or sufferings or struggles. Many are the afflictions of the who, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Interesting. There is literally no guarantee in scripture, as much as I would like it, thank you very much, that we won't suffer. I wish it weren't so. How many in this room would say, I, I would like very much to be out of the suffering process and thank you? You know what? I'm totally with you guys. But in the interest of honesty, 
and transparency, I can tell you, that's never been my experience. And unfortunately, it's probably not going to be yours. Because the truth is already found in the word of God that many afflictions do come our way. Jesus put it this way. He said, life is full of trouble. Literally full of trouble. Oh, man. No, I don't want you guys to think that today is about a Debbie Downer necessarily, but I think we do have to go through some of those darker areas to really understand where we are as humans and to be able to come up with a place where we know where God wants to meet us. So we have to acknowledge the bad to get to the good. I was in Search for Truth the, um, this past Wednesday, and we were talking about light, right, and the creation of light and how God causes light to dawn. But one of the things that's interesting, and I had mentioned it there so the students who were in the room would know this, but it's interesting how the Jewish people see their day. You and I wake in the morning typically, if our work schedule is conducive to that or our life schedule, and then we rest at night. And so our solar period, our 24-hour day, goes from light to dark. But not for the Jewish people. For the Jewish people, it goes from evening to morning. You emerge from darkness into light, and that makes your day. And here's the reality. In our experience as human beings, I can assure you of this much, that darkness only lasts for the night. And as the scripture says, there is a joy that comes in the morning. But getting to that place means that we have to acknowledge some of the things that are hurting and some of the things that are causing struggle. Let me ask all of you for a moment. Let's just have some interaction. How many of you, by a show of hands right now, feel like you are involved in a struggle or suffering or trouble or difficulty? Okay. Who in here is willing to share maybe a blurb? It can be really generic. You don't have to say all the gory details if you don't feel at liberty, but tell me the nature of some of your struggle. What are you going through right now that's, for you, hard, and you're saying, ugh? Somebody tell me. Anybody? It's hard to talk about them, huh? You got, you got something? Were you going to say something, Sister Cricket? Please. In case everyone wasn't able to hear that, essentially he's saying there's some, there's some trouble in the family and there are some hurtful words that are being exchanged and there's that burden. You know, when, when everyone in this room knows exactly what that is, when family, blood, says the thing that just, you know how I talked about breaking your heart, that thing that tears you in half and sometimes the only response of the soul are those tears that stream down the face. Because you can't always give word to what that is and how that feels. And you can't quantify it because vocabulary isn't always enough to really harness the power of what you're feeling. But you just know that from the depths of you, there's an ache, there's a pain, there's a suffering. Our brother is sharing something that's real and everyone in this room, just by looking at the emotion on your faces, knows exactly where he's at and has experienced this when the swords are crossed in family. This is the human experience. And you know what? As a church, it is our responsibility to talk about this because the, the things that God desires to do in these moments, he's going to do through community, which we're going to discuss shortly. Sister Cricket, you had something too?
Mm -hmm. I understand what you mean because I think all of us can agree in this room, and this will be the first point that we explore today, that suffering has many faces. It has many faces. It expresses itself in a variety of ways. Um, Here's the first bit of groundwork. It says in Acts 14 and 2, and I'm going to actually turn there for us. Acts 14 and 2, but for you, uh, excuse me, 14 and 22. I did not have the benefit of all the caffeine. (laughs) 14 and 22. This is what it says. It says, strengthening the souls of the disciples. This is after, just to lay a a little bit of of the foundation. This is after Paul has this incredible experience in which he sees this gentleman who is lame, and he prays, and that person is able to stand up and leap and all these wonderful things. And the people of this city start hailing them as gods, literally calling the disciples, like, you're Zeus, and, you're the, and we're, we're going to get offerings because there are gods among us. And they, they have, like, this exuberant response. Wow, this is incredible. We've never seen a miracle like this before. And then the Jews of the area come flooding in and planting seed. And what happens is these guys who are being hailed as gods and, of course, don't want any of these sacrifices and don't want those accolades are now having to dodge stones because instead the Jews plant this notion that there is something wrong with them and they deserve death. And so they struggle through this. And here's what they said starting in verse 21 for context, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, made many disciples. So even in the midst of the turmoil, even in the midst of dodging death, they're still making disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, so we're in Greece. And verse 22, strengthening, this is how they responded to their suffering. They strengthened the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and this is what they said. We must through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. How intriguing. You must. It's like that moth. No struggle, no strength. No struggle, no understanding of the sufferings of Christ. No struggle, no things being excised in your character to make you more like him. To enter the kingdom of God, you arrive there through and with the help of adversity. The help of adversity. I wish that everything was like Revelation 21, where we're hearing about new heavens, new earth, and every tear being wiped out of our eyes. Like, I want that. You want that. We long for that. But, you know, there's nothing about that that would even be attractive to any of us if we didn't know what tears tasted like. I wouldn't know the difference. If I had a completely easy life and God said, there's going to be a day where I wipe all the tears from your eyes and you will never have pain again. For me, that would mean nothing if I've had an easy life. That wouldn't be a promise. That would be my present reality. So what's special about that? The reality is you and I know that that's a precious promise because we've experienced the equal opposite. And that's what causes the longing for a different place. Just because we experience suffering, it doesn't mean our suffering is random. It doesn't mean it's without purpose. So suffering has many faces. Let's start there. Suffering has many faces. It's multifaceted. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 to 9. It says, we are afflicted in every way. So we have a family issue here, a spiritual issue of trying to struggle to get to a place and feeling like you have this push-pull between what God wants for you and what you feel the enemy's whispering in your ear. Anybody here ever have financial difficulty and it felt like it was literally just going to beat the tar out of you? I'm going to tell you, my husband and I, and here's the reality. Some of that (laughs) that we faced in financial difficulties were of our own making. Okay? Anybody in here ever make a stupid decision and choose to go out to eat at a nice restaurant to make yourself feel better instead of paying the water bill? Okay. Everybody's done that, right? (laughs) Everybody's done that. Everybody's had their boneheaded moments where you're like, dude, I had resources, and I watched that run away, and I was the one who kicked it out the house. All right? (laughs) 
And so we've been there. We've been there. But the other side of it is once we've done it and it's happened or life has happened to us and we lost a job or changed where we were living and had to reestablish ourselves, nothing's worse. I'm going to tell you, I, I'm at the point where I'm sort of like, cancer moving, cancer moving. Moving's worse. No, <laughs> I, I hate moving. I'm done. I've, I live the gypsy life of constantly moving, constantly moving, and feeling like I lived out of boxes. All of these things cause struggle. All of these things cause stress. All of these things cause anguish because at the end of the day, we are afflicted in every way. It's not a facet of our lives. Hey, go ask a teenager what it's like to have acne, all right? Suffering. Because when they're sitting in that class and people are making the statements that they make, it's like the world has ended for them. I'm being honest. Depending on your age, listen, when you're a two-year-old and mom says you're not getting that toy, that's suffering, man. <laughs> that's suffering. And we who are older are saying to ourselves, man, if that's suffering for you, kiddo, you got a lot of life to live. But we're acknowledging that it will come, it will continue to come, and it will become more complex as time goes on. But for that kid, them salty tears coming down his or her face are real. And they feel their little world has ended because they didn't get that doll or they didn't get that truck or they didn't. And, and you're looking at them and you're sort of like, wow, I wish life were that easy. How many times have you looked at somebody else's scenario that they're crying about and said, man, I wish life was that easy? Well, it's not easy for them. It's not easy for them. Maybe you've licked that one a thousand times and so you're more used to that brand of suffering. But it hurts right now for them. It says we're afflicted in every way, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, but not crushed. We're perplexed. Oh, man, I've had head scratchers in my day. Perplexed. What? This? Why? Since when? How? You ever ask those questions looking at your situation? <laughs> Are you kidding me right now? Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down. I've hit my knees in my life. Have you hit your knees figuratively or, or literally in your life? Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul is listing different types of suffering here. He's, talk, he's acknowledging mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. And let me tell you, for you and I, it's going to come in all of those ways. And if it hasn't yet for you in a particular way, just wait. Because life has a way of coming over with the poker and eh, just giving it to you in a spot. It does. And that is exactly what it is, brother. It's life. And it's not without purpose. Healing in these situations happens the way that it's going to begin to happen for our brother right here and for our sister back there. Because let me tell you something. Healing doesn't happen until you harness the power of a healer. That is the truth. Let me, let me, let me ask this question. Anybody here ever injure themselves in a way where they started to rapidly bleed? Rapidly bleed. And in the time, I'll ask my dad because I'm most familiar with what happened to him when he uh, was in those situations. When you were in the situation in which you started to rapidly bleed, what was your next step? What did you do? Stop it. Yeah. At any point, did you get medical help? He says, oh, yes. Why? Why? So check this out. This happened to me, too, in a hospital as well. I had a pick line in my arm to receive chemo. And I was, and of course, that line is always in me. And I was sleeping one night, and I rolled over and yanked the line. So I woke up because I felt an unusual warmth all over the entire side of my body. I was covered. Of course, when you're a leukemia patient, that's really, really dangerous. You need your blood, every drop of it. Everybody does. But a leukemia patient who's not reproducing it and the stuff they're reproducing is cancerous really needs what they've got. 
And so I pulled the distress cord. And the reason I did that is because, check it out, I was not equipped to handle my own situation. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That we seek someone else because we find ourselves in a circumstance for which we are not equipped to fix it. And can I just say that if the church is being the church, then our brother has a bleeder and all of you know how to stitch. That is what the church must be because healing comes in community. Sometimes we dig our heels in and we say, I'm going to do my business exclusively with God. But God may want to do his business through someone else. And you need to give him the space to do that. You know, it says confess our faults one to another so that what? We can be healed. And you know what? Fault can be used in a very broad sense. That thing that's just not going right for you. Whether it's of your doing or not. And please... If it is of someone's doing, that they have found themselves in trouble and in suffering and in stress and in pain, let's not use the puppy method and rub their face in the mess. Let's use the godly method of saying, I see your mess, but I'm still going to wrap my arms around you and love you. And if that means I have to tell you the truth of how to avoid it in the future, I will. But for right now, your healing is more important than the education I think I need to give you. Let me get you healed so you can hear me. It's like in AA. In AA, you don't counsel or 12-step a person when they're drunk. Because they're not going to remember a thing you just said. They're impaired. They're not operating with all their faculties. Brothers and sisters, when people come in here wounded and hurting, even if it is of their own doing, they're not operating with their faculties. Let's get their mind and their conscience cleared first. Let's help them through the other side of this, and then we can walk them through the steps of gaining strength and not falling back into that big old pothole. You don't learn the route to avoid a pothole until you first go into it, come out the other side and recognize, where is that located again? Let me look back. All right, because next time when I come around this corner, I'm going to make that turn a little bit wider. Right? That's what we do. We do this every day of our lives. I had a, we had a bed frame that was the bane of my existence. It had this sharp edge. And for a while, I had like a permanent scar. It felt like I had that scar for three years off of how many times I bang, bang. And I was so dumb because every time I'd bang into it, I'd say to myself, I should have remembered where that was. I should have remembered where that was. How did I do this again? One day, I, we got smart. We decided to take some washcloths, pack them up, <laughs> and tie it around. It took me a little while to get the brain cells in the direction of, hey, Stupid. You keep hitting that. Maybe you stop trying to necessarily remind yourself and put something in place so that if you graze by that, it's not as sharp anymore. But you know what? Life is the exact same way. And there are multiple ways to sometimes do a thing. And there are multiple ways to guard yourself and learn how to get past certain pain points. And that may be coming through avoidance or it may be coming through patting something down so that it doesn't hurt you as much. But whatever that is, understand that you don't operate in your best place when you're in the middle of your suffering. You need someone, something else, bigger than yourself that's not clouded by those emotions in that moment. You need somebody on the outside, as we're going to be for our brother right here, to listen to what his pain is, to understand what his suffering is right now, to be thinking that God can certainly be a part of his situation and be asking for the active voice of God in us so we end up with a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge and discernment. That's what the spirit is for the church. The spirit for the church is the equipper that allows you and I to operate in ministry. And you know what the key to ministry is? It happens to someone else through me. That's the key to ministry. Ministry is what I do to affect you. So this I will leave as just food for thought. 
if you come into this place, this wonderful building that God has blessed us with but doesn't actually represent the church, if you, as a member in particular, are coming and sitting down and you're wondering, what is my ministry? What am I supposed to do? It seems like all the ministry is happening up there. No. A thousand times no. All the ministry is not happening up there. If you're wondering what you're supposed to do, know that you've been imbued with the power of the Holy Ghost. And that spirit that is speaking to you doesn't just want to deal with you. That spirit speaking to you would also like to speak through you. And that means that you can not only be in the fellowship of God's sufferings, as it says in the scripture, but you can be in the fellowship of your brothers' and sisters' sufferings. Let's read Galatians 6 and 2. My husband's favorite book of the Bible, Galatians. He loves it. Galatians 6 and 2, it says this. Bear one another's burdens. Bear it. So, Brother Marvin, let me ask you a question. I choose Marvin, my friend. <laughs> Marvin and I, I will just, let me put a little footnote here to understand why I will always choose Marvin for these things. Marvin and I, in many regards, can be very much polar opposites. <laughs> and we both know it. However, there's a lovely little space where he and I agree deeply. And that's the awesome spot. Everything else we'll fight about. Anyways, <laughs> Marvin, if I came up to the church door, and I had arms full. Oh, and you can see, knowing my back condition, you can see that I'm bowled over by the weight of everything that I'm carrying. What would be the first thing you do? Open the door for me or come out and take some of the, try to take some of the load? Can I just say it's not enough to open the door and let the sinners come in? That's cool that the door's open. Thanks. But they're struggling under the enormity of weight. If Marvin just opened the door for me and let me hobble in, breaking my back, I wouldn't call him a gentleman. And if all you did as a Christian was make an invitation and let somebody come through the door and do nothing more than that, I don't know if I could call you a Christian. It says in the scripture, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That Greek word for law is nomos. If you're a note taker, N-O-M-O-S, if we're going to do the transliteration, nomos. It means a law or rule that produces a state that God approves of. Whoa. Let's read that back into the scripture now, knowing what law means. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law and rule that produces a state approved by God. That's what that scripture is actually saying. That God will look at you with, I'm noticing that you are exhausted and those, those kids that you have, you are bearing the sole responsibility. Can I make you a meal once a week so you don't have to cook that night? It's, it's a small thing, but can I do that? Hey, hey, uh, hey, couple, can I, can I watch your kid for a night? Hey, um, individual who's, who's getting on in years, and maybe some tasks are not easy for you anymore, can I mow your lawn? Hey, you know, I'm noticing that you had an injury recently, and it's been hard for you to work. Can I just bless you and take care of one bill for you this month? That's Christianity, folks. That's Christianity. Christianity is not Sunday best and, you know, waving your hands around and doing your little praise dance. That's not actually Christianity. Christianity is being Christ-like. I don't see the scriptures where he's dancing and hopping and, and whooping and shouting. I see scriptures where he's ministering and getting spit on. I see scriptures where he's out in the streets and he's looking at sinners and saying, I'm not condemning you either. Go. Sin no more. 
I see scriptures where he's laying hands on people who are broken and they're made whole. I see scriptures where he's challenging the religious establishment and saying, I'm going to nail you where you are for your hypocrisy. That is Christ-like. You want to be like Christ? Get your hands dirty. You want to be like Christ? Look at the suffering of other humans full in the face. There's this, um, there's this singer, uh, Brooke Ly Ligertwood is her married name now, but her original name was Brooke Frazier, which I think is much more marketable and easier to say, but hey. And she, she went on this missions trip to Rwanda. Ooh, Rwanda has some serious history of war. Big, devastating, nasty war. Death, 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 and devastation. Tough. God, the people who live in Rwanda, the, the pain and suffering that they're going through. And she was sitting in a room with a mother and a daughter. And as she's talking to them on her missions trip, trying to get to know what it was for, for them, a bullet came through the window and shot the mother point blank dead. And in, in, her, in the aftermath of her missions trip, she wrote this song. And she talks about this young girl that she's now left there with, this young girl who no longer has a mother. And she talks about the voice and she, of, of the mother. And she talks about, and the bullet in the wall where the voice fell silent. And she says this, she says, Rwanda, now that I have seen, I am responsible. Faith without deeds is dead. You know what our problem sometimes in the church is, is we close our eyes because we know that. That if I really look in the face of someone else's suffering, it does make me responsible. Makes me responsible to do something. If you can just do this, oh boy, I don't know, you're a different sort, I guess. But in reality, you and I, when we open our eyes and actually look, it is supposed to evoke something in us. It is supposed to inspire something in us. And if it doesn't, if you can look at suffering and feel nothing and feel no need to step in, if there's no measure of bravery in your soul, then I would urge you to find an altar because the heart of God is moved by compassion. And if you lack the compassion, then you lack the heart. At the very least, the heart is not fully active in you. I'm not saying that you need to go through the rest of your life crying over everything you see. Maybe you're not that sort, like my, my precious brother Marvin. I cry, he stays pretty stoic. <laughs> but here's what I do know, that my brother Marvin, for all of the, the, the stoic quality to his nature, when I said we need to, we need to do something to have a full-time pantry built me a wall, okay? So he knows when he's seeing need, right? We need the heart of God. Have your personality, man. I'm not debating your personality but have the heart of God in your personality and be what God is calling you to be and use the resources that you have at your disposal to be a part of healing in community. Church is meant to be a refuge for the suffering. When a member is hurting, the church applies the bandages. That's what it's supposed to do. When a member is down, the church is supposed to encourage. When a member is in need, the church is supposed to come alongside to help. When people outside of these doors do that, and need that, we should be doing exactly the same in whatever way we can. Let's not forget that our God said, at the end of all things, how he's judging the church is, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was imprisoned or alone, did you visit me? James says it this way. He says, true religion, James, being an actual blood brother, if you will, of Je or at least half-brother of Jesus, here's what he said. He said, true religion and undefiled is to visit the orphan and the widow in their suffering. That's true religion. That's incredible. Suffering equips us for ministry. I want to read something. This is the next point we'll make. 
in the, in the minutes that we have remaining. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Wow. <sighs> Jesus has this habit of saying things that knock us in the face. <laughs> I've gotten a lot of uppercuts from the Lord. <laughs> and here's what he says here. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. To understand Jewish discipleship, the way that they understood it. If you had a teacher, a rabbi, a master, and you decided you wanted to be their disciple, you followed them in everything that they did. You wore what they wore, you ate what they ate, you slept where they slept. There are, there are ancient stories that disciples of a rabbi wanted to be so in sync with the rabbi that they would literally, if the rabbi laid on his bed at night, the disciple would slide under the bed just to lay in the same shadow. And it was this incredible devotion to the idea that if you are my teacher, I must learn from you in every facet that I can possibly learn. And here's what is tough. Because when the rabbi suffers, in theory, the disciple should and would if the disciple is not living by means that are above the rabbi. Let me make sure you caught what I just said. If the disciple is not living by its own means that it's acquiring to be above the rabbi, then if the rabbi is hungry, the disciple is hungry. If the rabbi is in need and without money, the disciple is too, because the disciple is patterning their lives perfectly. So, let's understand what this means. Jesus is saying, if I am your rabbi, if I'm your teacher, if I'm your master and Lord, and you are my disciple in the truest sense that whatever I do, you do, then you can't avoid my cross. You don't get to just skip out of that process. You don't get to just say, okay, you know, Jesus, I'm, I'm cool with all, like, the ministry stuff and the raising from the dead, like I'm cool with you raising things up back to life in my life. Um, I'm cool with that. But this whole cross and suffering and beatings and all, nah. That's the point where I'm going to say you've taught me all that you can. And he's saying if you don't pick up that cross, man, if you don't bear some things that are heavy and hard in your life, then you're not really my disciple and you actually can't be. You don't get to just avoid the process that brought salvation. Because his suffering is why you're free. And if you're going to be with him in the fellowship of his resurrection, you have to be in the fellowship of his death too. And that means things in you and I will have to die. And guess what? I've seen it as a chaplain. Death is not a pleasant process. It's not always. It's not the TV glamour of, I've always loved you. Okay? It's not always that, all right? <laughs> Like, it, sometimes it comes on the heels of, of devastating things. And let me just say to you that for those things in you and I, those character defects and flaws that we have to die in our lives, sometimes it has to come through a cut. And sometimes there's an ouch. And sometimes it is only through the fracturing of a bone, the fracturing of a family. Sometimes it is only through that that the thing that grows back becomes calcified harder and becomes harder to break in the future. That is what your bones do. Your bones break, and if they are able to fuse back in a healthy fashion, that spot can sometimes become harder and thicker as a result of the overproduction of bone material and the calcification process. And I will tell you that sometimes in the breaking we are made strong. Let's continue on. It says in 2 Corinthians 1 and 4 this, because I'm going to tell you, firsthand experience in suffering is essential for the equipping of ministry. You are not going to do your best ministry if it's always butterflies and birthday cakes for you. It, you're not. You're not. I, <laughs> have you ever seen a, a very young person 
get up and testify or preach. And you're sitting there and you're like, yep. that's awesome. But I can also tell that the experience of life hasn't walloped you yet. <laughs> that's cool. Keep spreading those wings. Like, keep beating against that cocoon. Because you're going to deepen in your understanding of God when you go through a few things. Marriage is not forged from courtship. I promise you. <laughs> All my married folks in this room know that you didn't know how powerful your marriage was until the two of you were belly up trying to suffer through something together and had to figure it out. It wasn't in the googly eyes and, oh, my God, you're so cute. Um, it wasn't through any of that, okay? <laughs> it wasn't through any of that. Like, that was, that was like opening the door, right? But, uh, but then you start carrying some things, and you start, will you grab one of these bags? You know, it changes, okay? <laughs> it changes. It changes. And it, it becomes stronger through adversity like muscles do. When you've, I'm going to read a passage in these very last few moments. It's from Suffering and the Sovereignty of God. And it says this, when you've passed through your own fiery trials and found God to be true to what he says, you have real help to offer. You have firsthand experience of both his sustaining grace and his purposeful design. He's kept you through pain. He has reshaped you more into his image. What you're experiencing from God, you can give away in increasing measure to others. You are learning both the tenderness and the clarity necessary to help sanctify another person's deepest distress. Have you ever thought that perhaps you have the capacity to make holy someone else's distress? And have you ever thought that maybe in your life God is making your pain something holy? We think of pain and it's just bad, 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 make it stop, make it stop. But we never think about what it's doing for us. It's not just there to torture you. It's not just there to tempt or test you necessarily. Depending on how you look at it, you will understand that suffering is a war. And you will be careful you don't make it a battle between yourself and God. Yeah, it's a war. It's a battle for your soul when you're going through suffering. The book of Job shows us there's two ways to respond. You can either curse God or you can bless God in it. You can, you can come to a place where you look at the Almighty and you're asking, what's up with you? And he looks back down and says, I know exactly what my business is. I made this whole thing. What's up with you? <laughs> He's the only one that can put us on trial. He is. And maybe that doesn't always sit right with our humanity. It doesn't always sit right with mine. Sometimes I want answers. How about you? You ever really just say, I need some answers? <laughs> I need some answers right now. And sometimes, like in the case of Job, you and I know why it happened. But I can't for the life of you tell you that I ever see in the pages of the book of Job that God ever told Job why it happened. I have got to get to a place of understanding that there is one who will answer my questions as he sees fit, but has a mind and a power that is so far above mine that even if he gave me the answers, I still wouldn't understand. <laughs> so how about I take what he's doing right now, and I understand this, that he says this in the scripture in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18, this light momentary affliction, oh, Hold on. My humanity doesn't like that. Don't tell me it's light and momentary. It's heavy and it's been going on forever. <laughs> it feels that way, but in the eternity of God, he's sort of looking at it like, this isn't even a blip on the radar. I'm preparing you to be with me for all of eternity. You think after about, you know, a thousand years, you're even going to remember this moment? You won't even remember it. It won't even matter. What matters is what it did to prepare you to see my face. This light and momentary affliction is preparing us for, eternal, for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not at the things that are seen. Yeah, I see it. It's here. Don't focus on it. But to the things that are unseen. 
There is a place, there is a space where all of this will make sense, where the tears that I have shed in my lifetime will be wiped away, where my broken heart will be mended, where the pain in my body that I deal with every single day will be gone. There will be a day where I come on the other side and I can truly say I was faithful through it. He that endures to the end will be saved. It says for the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary, they're only here for a moment, but the things that are unseen are eternal. An evangelist told this story, he said, I have a friend who in a time of business recession lost his job, sizable fortune, beautiful home. And to add to his sorrow, his precious wife died. Yet he tenaciously held on to his faith as the only thing he had left. And one day when he was out walking in search of employment, he stopped to watch some men who were doing stonework on a large church. And one of them was working hard on this triangular piece of rock, chiseling, chiseling, working it, shaping it, working so hard on something very small. He's just going at it. And this man, he says, what are you you gonna do with it? Where are you gonna put it? And the workman said, do you see that tiny opening right up there near the spire? And the man looks up in the direction that he's pointing, and he says, whew, it's pretty tiny, but yeah, I, 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 see, I see that little gap. And the worker says, well, I'm shaping this stone down here so that it'll fit in up there. I'm shaping it down here so it's going to fit in up there. Everything that chisels at you and I is working to make sure that while we're down here, we take the shape to fit in up there. Whether that's through your own personal suffering or aiding someone when they're in struggle, that is part of the chiseling process that makes us fit in the family and body of God. So we're going to stop there for today. Any thoughts, questions, anything at all?